really kind of a segue from the pre previous talk, uh, really thinking about it part two. Um, we mentioned before that we privilege pedagogy over tools. And so this particular presentation is about iPads. But imagining that the consult process has already happened and that iPads have been suggested as a um, good tool for this work. So my name is Yasmin Eisenhower. <laughs> and with me, I've got I'm Alex Martinez. I'm an instructional technology specialist at this college. Great. Those are put us on Twitter as well as our department. Okay. So if you're tweeting, please pop back. <laughs> so we know that the iPad is a fantastic tool to to facilitate blended learning approaches. And in the spring of 2013, Smith College kind of formally um, created an iPad program. Um, it allows both students and faculty to borrow iPads for a short at, or as long as they need over the course of a given semester. Um, it began with just 60 students in five classes. And since then, we've had 40 faculty implement iPads in over 50 courses across the campus. Um, while faculty are implementing um, iPads, it's not always mandatory for them, them to come to us and have a consult about how best to do this, but we always encourage a one-on-one -on -one consultation just because it allows us to share with them kind of our insights, our best practices, our kind of pedagogical understanding <coughs> of global learning, as well as get a global perspective on how these devices are used on our campus. Um, and so what we are going to do today in this next 20 minutes is we're gonna share kind of seven key takeaways um, in our experience at College thus far. Um, and before we do that, we've got a quick video from Apple because you know they're genius at marketing and we want to take a look at what words they use to describe the potential of the iPad. as well as on the students 
in thinking about this as an educational device. An alternate perspective that when we work with faculty we like to offer is the idea of visitors versus residents. And this is, came out of a paper from David White and Allison LeCornu, who took a look at what motivates engagement in a digital learning environment. They wanted to offer an alternative to Mark Prensky's digital native theory um, and offer a different typology. So visitors and residents map individuals' engagement with the web and argue that in metaphor, that and argue that the metaphors of place and tool most appropriately represent the use of technology in contemporary society, especially given the advent of social media. Visitors and residents continuum, and it's, it is a spectrum, accounts for people behaving, behaving in different ways when using technology depending on their motivation and context without categorizing them according to age or background. A wider and more accurate representation of online behavior is therefore established. So by framing this technology skill within this context, it allows faculty to feel confident about the skill they have, irrespective of whether and where they place themselves, say, on an adoption spectrum. And it also helps them to think, well, my skills may be transferable. If I can, if I can use email, maybe I can use Facebook. And if I can use Tumblr, perhaps I can use Moodle. We frame it in the affirmative to help them foster a technology resilience and really impact their growth mindset. So iPad is group. Part of our work as instructional technologies is to really advance the rate of adoption on the part of our faculty. And we know that iPads provide a pathway for blending learning, blended learning approaches. Um, and so the question we ask ourselves all the time is how do we co cultivate a technology growth mindset together with our faculty? And we're really looking at kind of the research of Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck, mm -hmm. who studies motivation. Are you all familiar with mm -hmm. the mindset? Yeah. So studying motivation, and we know that um, there is six versus a growth mindset. And in thinking about technology, we want to better frame questions for our faculty, such as, I understand the pedagogical advances of implementing iPads, but tech is risky. So that's the fixed mm -hmm. mindset. You know, will I, will I fail? Will I succeed? I'm really nervous. And instead flip that into the growth perspective, which is, I understand the pedagogical advantages of implementing iPads. Um, and I'm willing to make the time and investment to learn. I'll make sure I have a plan B. And so mm -hmm. that is part of our growth mindset. So one of the faculty members that we worked with this year is Professor Naomi Miller, who is also an English professor and Shakespeare scholar. And over the summer of 2015, she was gifted an iPad by her children who said, Mom, come on, get with it. <laughs> and and um, oh, in that same time frame, she um, attended a talk by Catherine Rowe, who's a former faculty member here at Bryn Mawr, but currently the provost at Smith College. And Catherine had been instrumental in developing a suite of uh, Shakespeare-related apps. Hmm. And so that motivated Naomi to say, huh, okay, maybe I might try to do that. Shakespeare is hard. and let me think about the tools that are at my disposal. So she came to us with her device, not knowing how to turn it on and off, <laughs> and we worked with her. Um, it was her first iPad implementation, and we also think the first of the English department. Um, and so there was a lot to discuss by way of workflow and getting her comfortable with this tool. But more than that, we knew that it was equally important to kind of assuage her fears of this technology and build her confidence in the tool. And so one of the things that we do that to support this growth mindset is we frame this to her students as a pilot. So that way students can come in and, and understand we're doing a pilot implementation and you have as much agency in kind of helping your faculty to understand this tool as your faculty is helping you to understand this tool within this class. Um, we also co-designed, Alice and I, um, with Deborah as well, the implementation plan of how this all works. Um, so we were in there a lot in the first term, on demand as needed, and in, made sure she had a plan B. <laughs> and the last piece, um, one of the things that we do is we talk to faculty about assessment of the technology. So we don't assume that technology directly impacts 
and we can't say, by using an iPad, I learned X, Y, and Z, but instead, we look at how does the iPad enhance the learning experience. And so if at the end, um, as we're suggesting faculty do assessments, if they feel that they've done badly, we say it's okay, you don't have to do an assessment this time around. Um, we'll chalk it up as kind of learning and we'll grow from there. We never want to put anything in their file that might impact tenure and promotion opportunities. So it was a great success story in terms of growth because first iteration, she used it, implemented it, and you'll hear more about her student comments. And then second implementation, she did it again, needed us less, and I assume that she'll be coming back. And so her quote, um, you know, thinking about the fact that this is her philosophy and approach to teaching and learning with her students, and it was flipped toward her and her mindset. And so we considered that a success. So in addition to being kind of alien and promoting growth mindsets, iPads are also engaging. They're this kind of exciting, flashy tool that you can bring in as first of this kind of novelty for your students that might make them a little bit more excited about the learning process. But for a tool to really be engaging past, say, the first week that students are using it, it needs to also be uniquely useful. So for Naomi's class in particular, for all of the iPad projects that we work on, we choose tools and apps that offer things such as creativity, or interactivity or multimodal learning options so that students can continue to engage in their learning actively throughout the semester. And students reported that as well. One student wrote in the assessment at the end of the semester that she was pleasantly surprised that she got to learn new hands <laughs> <laughs> the apps. She said that she felt old fashioned because she preferred paper texts, but actually we know that 90% of students in one study reported that they prefer physical text, so it's not that unusual. Uh, but for her, she could make an exception with this app because she could do things like take notes within the app, play performance quality audio of the play at any line, <coughs> the play, or sort the play based on characters. The major learning goals of the course were that students see Shakespeare's relevancy to today's world and also that they understand his language a little better because it's so complicated. And one student also reported exactly that. So <laughs> faculty member was pretty happy with that. <laughs> And while iPads are engaging, there's also the concern that they're too engaging. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've probably seen students disappear behind devices in a class before. Uh, so some instructors absolutely have concerns that students, when they're using these tools in a classroom, if they bring them in, they'll be using them for social media or for email and not for learning. In a blended classroom, where you expect students to say be reading their apps outside of the classroom and then coming in to engage in a deep discussion, that can be really harmful. So we know that we spend way, way too much time <laughs> engaging in this kind of thing already. You've probably checked your phone or your email since you've been here. I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know that students do these same things too. But we also know that our brains can only handle two complex tasks at one time and that those in fact even have to be related. So if students are off reading social media, it's probably not about art history and they may not be processing what you're saying. So, when we worked with Naomi's students, we worked with her to develop some guidelines and in class we navigated those with the students. And two of those were that when they brought their iPads to class, they would keep their Wi-Fi off because the apps didn't need Wi-Fi and well, that's just a distraction. And that for the first semester that she implemented this project, the students not bring their iPads to class on days they weren't using them. She relaxed those rules in later semesters so she got a little more comfortable with the iPads in class and then she began to sort of co-create the classroom guidelines with her students because giving them some agency in determining how the devices were used also helps them keep themselves from getting distracted. They have a little more state. Another way to deal with concerns about engagement was also for Naomi to remove the back of the classroom. And so what I mean by that is in a lecture hall it's a little difficult. If I was standing back there, you'd all be kind of uncomfortable. But a lot of our classrooms are seminar style rooms and students are gathered around a table for a discussion. But a lot like this classroom, a lot like really all of our classrooms, the lectern's up at the front. All of your technology is up here. And so if you want to be engaging in a discussion with your students as people sitting at the table, you also have to keep jumping up if you want to open a video clip or share a resource. And since discussion is such a major component in a blended classroom, not being able to really sit at the table and engage, and engage with your students can be really frustrating and can also lead to them feeling a little disengaged too. 
So what we did in our classrooms, not all of them, but some, was install Apple TVs, which is the thing I'm using today to be standing here projecting and not over there. Um, mm -hmm. And what it meant was that Naomi could wirelessly connect her iPad to the projector and sit at the back of the room with her students. So that's exactly what she's doing here. Even better, the students could project their own devices through the Apple TV and share materials with each other. And so she was giving them access to a tool that a faculty member mm -hmm. traditionally uses for teaching and inviting them into the knowledge creation space. So we've talked a little bit about engagement, but there are also additional risks that come in with using an iPad in a course. We've all experienced that anxiety that technology won't work when we expect it to. I know as we thought, yeah, we'll use an Apple TV at Rune Bar, we had that same thing that anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> And for faculty where every in-class moment is precious, the concern about loss of seat time can really mean that they are hesitant to implement a new technology, or especially a technology like an iPad that seems so foreign in the first place. So for example, with the Apple TVs in Naomi's course, we recognize that they don't always work as you anticipate them to, and we created backup plans, not just for Apple TVs, but for much of everything that she did. So in the case that it didn't work one day, she could plug in directly if she needed to. But we're going to do a few more risks as well. <laughs> um, because apps and mobile devices are constantly updating, new updates are pushed weekly, if not more often than that, uh, their operating systems are always changing. And in this course in particular, an update to the operating system caused one of the apps to stop functioning. And that's really rare for us. It's unusual that something breaks in a way that we can't troubleshoot or work through or find a workaround for. But in this case, what it did was made it so that when the student was reading the app, uh, reading in the app and wanted to listen to the performance, it played from the beginning instead of playing from where they were reading, which suddenly uh, the app is immensely less useful. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, we were really fortunate. The developers of these apps are a small startup instead of a large corporation. It was really easy to get in touch with someone who could fix our problem mm -hmm. and who cared that we were having this problem in the first place. So we worked with them to diagnose, they were able to push a beta version of the app within a couple of weeks when Naomi was relying on using the iPad within a month in her class, mm -hmm. and students had a working version. It was also really just a wonderful experience for us to learn that we could rely on the developers behind our tools. It meant that we could understand who was working behind them. We felt a little bit more like we could trust that they would work, which is we expect our faculty to, but sometimes we have that skepticism too. Um, and for them, it was a great chance to build a relationship with their customer base and get an idea of how their tools were being used in class. Since then, we began to de build relationships with other developers of apps that we use in classes and rely upon a lot. And it's been really great because we also get to keep up on what they're doing. They'll send us information a little bit earlier and let us know this cool new thing that we should check out. And yet another risk um, to using students, uh, to using iPads in the class that we try to mitigate is considering student privacy. So we take a look at any app that we use, not just for whether it's purple compliant, but how student data is used, how it's protected, if students retain ownership of and access to the works that they create. And so this is Yasmin's created how to vet an app sheet, and we'll make sure that you have access to that in the future if you're interested in it, because the text is a little small to read it. Another takeaway about iPads that we realized was that they can be a great force for equity in a classroom if you put in the framework to make it happen. So when we considered the student experience with apps and iPads, we also wanted to think about if they're taking on a blended learning uh, initiative in their course, we don't want them to have to also assume new costs, especially for a pilot type project. So we have three ways to do that. One of which is that we have an iPad loaner program, so students who don't own iPads, which is often the vast majority of them, can borrow them. Before the project starts and before students are expected to create work that's due for their courses, they have time to explore the iPads, because we can assume that they've maybe used one before, but that doesn't mean they're comfortable with using it for email or the settings and making sure it doesn't beep when they're in class, so just some time to get comfortable and also to explore the apps they'll be using. And then as Yasmin mentioned, we go into the class and we provide in-class workshops <coughs> on the workflows that they'll need to know to do their assignments. As a follow-up to that, we, we, we provide written and video instructions that they can follow and reference back to because we don't expect them to remember everything they hear that one time they see us. All right, very last point, I'm at iPads are immersive. They're immersive in, um, in enabling several paths to blended learning. They can solve for a geographic barrier in, in 
enable a blended student attendance in a given course, as well as situate learning, learners within virtual learning environments. And so we want to take quickly <laughs> a look at two uh, instances. So here we acquired a telepresence robot. Um, we often have, as part of our consortium, students who attend from other campuses. And so in this one particular, in two particular classes, we've now used it to enable students who cannot attend um, geographically to attend a face-to-face -face course at Smith. So we put the robot in and the student can control it remotely and um, in fact can pair up and engage in, in a pair conversation practice. Um, a second way that we have looked at iPads is to blend the real world and enable learners to take, say, virtual field trips. And um, we used a particular app called Paris 3D in Elsa's class was with us today. Um, and it allowed people to take these virtual field trips so that it um, places their course content within a rich contextual setting that closely mirrors kind of a real world, that be that world from many years past, historically speaking, or current day and present. Um, and so oftentimes, a lot of this virtual and augmented reality technology is being developed for corporate implementation. But educators are also looking at it, and, um, and so we're excited to see where it takes us. And I know we're at time, so I'm going to just stop there. <laughs> but I look forward to, we look forward to kind of studying this more, more as it evolves, and that's our time. Thank you.